Welcome to worship this evening at Morrison Zion Lutheran. Tonight we're recording the service uh, to live stream on Sunday since if it doesn't rain we'll be outside on a Sunday morning and won't have the equipment. So if you all want to go sit right next to a microphone and sing nice and loud tonight so that people can hear the singing, that would be wonderful. In the church here this week is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost and during the first weeks of Pentecost we've been looking at faith. Tonight we see how the faith that, that is strengthened in worship uh, provides real rest, rest for our souls. So we see tonight worship gives us that real rest that Christ has won for us. We'll worship the Lord using the order of service, a, a version of Divine Service 2 that's printed in your service folder and that is also on the screens this evening or on the screens online. I invite you now to join together in singing verses 1 and 3 of I want to walk as a child of the light. As you're able, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. 
Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture lesson today is from 1 Samuel chapter 21. In our gospel, Jesus will remind us that the Sabbath was made for uh, man, not man for the Sabbath. We see an example of that when David eats what was forbidden for him to eat. David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered to Himelech the priest. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. 
how much more so today. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot, day on, hot bread on the day it was taken away. This is the word of our God. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 122. We'll sing the refrain and read the verses together. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson, which is also our sermon text today, is from Paul's letter to the Christians in Colossae in chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Here he reminds us of the proper focus of our worship life. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This is the word of our God. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. Out of respect for Jesus, please stand for the words of his gospel. The gospel, according to Mark chapter 2. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. We continue with the first three verses of hymn 190. We now implore God the Holy Ghost. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Word of God before us this evening as we focus on how worship, uh, as God lays it out for us and tends for us, gives us real rest, is our second lesson from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. It's on page 5 in your service folder if you'd like to follow along as we talk about it. In Christ, dear fellow redeemed. Throughout my ministry, almost always we've had, I've served in a church that has had weeknight services, like the Thursday night service we have here tonight. And in many ways, they've always been kind of my favorite. And it's not just because Ron Tim is here. That's my, what you might think, but that's not it. It's because usually there's nothing afterwards. You know, you're not, I'm not thinking about what meeting do I got to run to or who do I have to go see this afternoon or, you know, after the service is done, like sometimes it's there on a Sunday. But it's, the day is, you know, come to a kind of a close. You come into a church at seven at night and you sit down and you don't have to think about all this other stuff that can be kind of distracting. Instead, you can just focus on God, who he is, what he's done for you. And at least for me, I've always been able to focus on it better when I'm not thinking about everything else I have to do after a Sunday service. That distraction by what I need to do 
is, is kind of what uh, Paul is writing to the Christians in Colossae about. They were getting pressure. Last week we talked about the, the false teachers in Colossae that, that Paul is writing this letter about. He had heard about it from Epaphras. He had never been there, but he sends this letter to them while he's in prison in Rome because he wants them to focus not on what they are doing. The false teachers were telling him, as you can kind of hear from what I read to you, that you need to uh, keep new moon festivals. You need to have, uh, keep the Sabbath laws. You need to keep this law and that law. And if you aren't doing all the ceremonial things that were there in the Old Testament, you're not really a good enough Christian. So Paul, as, as one of the errors that he is addressing, was what he addresses and what I read to you, he again stresses the all-sufficiency of Jesus. That's the theme of this letter, like we talked about last week. Jesus is, is, is enough. You don't need Jesus plus. You just need Jesus, who he is and what he has done for you. And he brings that out tonight when he's talking about what worship is all about. You know, that whole first paragraph is, is talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus did. It's not talking about what any of his people did. Because it starts out by reminding us there isn't anything we could do to pay for our sins. Because when you were dead in your sins, Christ made you alive. He lived and died in your place. He sent the Spirit. It's his work. God is doing the work. So don't place your confidence in keeping ceremonies or these other things because that's not how you became a Christian in the first place and that's not what makes you a Christian. That's not what makes you even a better Christian than someone else. It's all about Jesus. And he just kind of hammers that home. He talks about all of those ceremonies, how they were just a shadow of the things to come. The reality is Jesus. So focus on the reality. Because it's only Jesus that, how did he put it in here? He forgave us our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Our legal indebtedness that stood against us and condemned us is that written code of the law. The ceremonial law, which they couldn't keep, the moral law, which is God's right and wrong of all time, they couldn't keep it perfectly. You can't keep it perfectly. No one can do all the things that are required of us in the law because we're dead in sins. So if you're going to say, I'm a better Christian because look at what I'm doing, you're looking in the wrong place, in the wrong direction. Paul says, put your eyes on Jesus. He's the one that canceled the written code of the debt you owe to perfection because he paid it in your behalf. He's the one that hung on the cross as the punishment for your sins. He's the one that defeated the powers and authorities that stood against you, that were condemning you because you didn't keep the law. The devil. He's the one that defeated him and then led a, a triumphant possession, a procession in the cross, made a public spectacle of them triumphing, leading them in a triumphant procession. It's a picture of the, the old Roman armies after they defeated someone they would parade through Rome, the, the conquered people, and show how that, that people that were a threat are no longer a threat to you because they have been defeated. Jesus did that. When you look at another place in the Bible, when he went and made proclamation to the spirits who were in prison who died long ago during the days of Noah. This is talking about his descent into hell. Jesus, we say it in the creed all the time, he descended into hell. He did not descend into hell to pay for sins. He had paid for all of our sins when on the cross right before he died, he said, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his life. He was talking about his ministry, his work. Atoning for your sins, canceling the written code that stood against you, that legal indebtedness. He forgave us all our sins when we were dead in our sins. And then he let Satan and all those who had failed to listen to his word, know that he had won the victory. The debt had been paid. The, the, the charges against us were all ripped up. And we are his forgiven children, holy in his eyes because of his life and his death. 
this is what God's plan is for us when we come to worship. This is what we focus on, are to focus on. There were those in Colossae that were saying, that's a good start, but you have to do this, this, and this. New moon celebrations, Sabbath days, all these other things. These requirements of the law. It reminds them the law has been canceled by Christ. It was a shadow of what was to come. So don't focus on the shadow now. Focus on Christ. But they were being tempted to turn around back to placing their confidence in what they were doing. So he says, don't let anyone judge you in that because you have been forgiven in Christ and you have been set free. This is the focus of our worship. We don't come to worship to do something for God to make him love us. He loved us before we were born. He loved us before the creation of the world when he planned our salvation through Jesus. His love for us is already complete, absolute, and perfect. We don't do things to make him love us. If you say, I'm going to worship, I'm going to come to worship so that I'm a better Christian than those who don't and God will love me more, you're looking in the wrong direction. You're looking at yourself instead of at Jesus. Now, on the other hand, I've talked to people lately that I think avoid that ditch of saying, I'm doing something for God so that he'll love me by driving their car right into the ditch on the other side of the road that says, written code's been canceled. Nothing I do saves me. If going to worship doesn't make God love me more, I'm not going to go. I don't have to go. I've already been saved by Jesus. That's a ditch just as certainly as I'm saving my, God makes, loves, I make God love me more by, by worshiping more, is a ditch. Both of them have the wrong focus. The focus is on I, what I am doing, or what I don't have to do. Worship that's going to give us rest, rest from the work of saving ourselves, is the worship that looks at Jesus and only at Jesus, and marvels at the depth of his love for us. Because even though you and I know that Jesus has taken away the guilt of our sin, there are times that we wake up in the middle of the night troubled by the guilt of our sin. We know how we have failed our God. We know what he has asked us to do that we haven't done. And in worship and in our faith, our trust that Jesus took away our guilt, we find peace. We find rest. I don't know why I wouldn't want that rest. Why I wouldn't want that peace. Why I wouldn't want the promises of God's abiding presence in my life. Worship, whether it's alone or with others, gives me that rest. The advantage that worship with others has is what God talks about in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As we worship together, we have the opportunity to point each other to the only thing that gives rest, which is Jesus. We remind each other it's all about Jesus as we speak our confession together, as we rejoice in the absolution together, as we sing our hymns together. We're saying something to each other about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And I want to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want them to encourage me because at various times we're all hurt in units. And we all need to be pointed back to who Jesus is. Not to who, what we do or not to what we don't have to do, but to Jesus. Worship doesn't save us. But worship builds our faith. And our faith is in Jesus who has saved us. And that brings us closer to Jesus and enables us to rest, find peace and rest in his promises day after day after day. I think it's one of the marks, I think, of a, a Christian that starts to get it. Is that they don't view this as something they're doing for God. They view it as a, as a place that's like a hospital, that when I am beaten, bloodied, and broken, God gives me rest for my soul. And he does it by pointing me to Jesus. And he does it not just through the pastors, 
but he does it through my brothers and sisters in Christ as we worship together or before or after worship as they point me to Jesus and not to myself. This is the rest Christ has won for us. And this is why we want to keep building our faith because we want our focus to always be on him. And worship provides us a wonderful opportunity to keep our eyes and encourage each other to have their eyes Focus squarely on Jesus. Amen. As you're able, please stand. I invite you now to join together in confessing the Christian faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the responsive prayer of the church on the screens or printed in your service folder. O oh Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. We bring you our request for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own, that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. As you're able, please stand for prayer. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you've given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Congregation may be seated. We close with verses 3 and 5 of hymn 460, How Can I Thank You, Lord? Good evening. good evening. Thank you for joining us in worship, and good morning to those who joined us on Sunday morning as this recording is broadcast. Uh, if you didn't pick up the announcement sheet on your way into church, I encourage you to do so on the way out. A reminder, on July 11th, we have a, a voters meeting to look at air conditioning for the church, and there are some other things going on with Vacation Bible School that day, and school board, I believe, as well. But there are a number of things in there. Uh, I uh, hope you take the time to read through it and join us whenever you can. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and may the Lord bless your week.